So often we struggle on our own trying to make sense of current issues impacting our business, things that we should maybe be dealing with in more detail, but we struggle to understand the exact issues. We struggle to understand how our business can actually help the situation. And this is where you don't need to struggle on your own anymore. There are experts out there who can help you. And one such expert I invited recently into the Startup and Grow Club. So welcome to episode 45. Glamping and unique holiday rentals are surging in popularity with the growing desire of customers to book holidays that deliver an experience. They are also the new business of choice for those wanting to improve their work-life balance. So how do you build a strong business like this that gives you the life you need and a great investment? I'm Sarah Riley and I want to share what I've discovered after being immersed in this industry for over 20 years to inspire you to find out more about what's going on. Welcome, this is the business of glamping and unique holiday rentals. Hello and thank you for joining me today. It's really great to have you here. I'm excited to be sharing this with you today because honestly, as small business owners, we do often find ourselves on our own trying to make sense of stuff and it's a struggle and it can often feel lonely and we have a passion for our businesses. We want them to succeed, but often we just don't understand what direction we need to take and the steps that we need to follow. Some of the issues are actually really important to tackle if we want to run successful businesses that grow in strength and thrive. And having a community of people around you who are in exactly the same unique business is gold. You can bounce ideas off each other, you can be inspired, re-energized when quite frankly you're lacking motivation. And you know, it's, it's really important to be able to get the essential answers to your questions. So feel like you're not on your own. So this is what members like so much about the Startup and Grow Club, because we're able to tackle topics which are really relevant to this industry, things which are happening now in the moment, so when the pandemic was happening, also when environmental issues are happening, all this kind of thing. And so actually recently we've had all kinds of experts come in and talk about certain things which really matter in this industry. So we've talked about new and emerging glamping business models, income generation techniques, selling without selling, guest attraction and marketing, pay-per-click ad success, food safety and hygiene, which is particularly important when things are being introduced in terms of new legislation, which it has been recently because of the terrible situation when someone had some food which they were allergic to, it wasn't labeled, and unfortunately they died from a a reaction that they had to that food. And as people who offer food to our businesses, it's incredibly important we understand what the laws are so we protect ourselves as well as protecting our guests. We also had land agents who came in and gave us information around land prices and how to secure land when we're looking for land and we're looking for some kind of space where we can have our business, crowdfunding a new project and getting the money to finance that new, new business is something we had an expert come in and talk about as well. We have very soon got someone coming into the club to talk about styling a space We've had accountants come in, water safety experts. We've talked about recession proofing our businesses. And we have all kinds of people who have come in and talked about topics that are important, relevant, and very much the center of what people are thinking about with regard to a unique glamping business and accommodation business. So one of those things is around rewilding, it's around environmental protection and thinking about sustainability and where our businesses fit with that. So I invited Sarah King in from Rewilding Britain to join the club and we had a really great presentation from her and a very good and deep question and answer analysis around members' individual properties and their ambitions for rewilding on their 
land and with the guests and how they could build that so that it would actually benefit their business instead of being a negative thing that would just cost them money. So a copy of the presentation that goes with this is going to be with the show notes. So do download that and have a look at that while you're listening to this audio. I hope you enjoy this session on the topic. It's just a bit of a taster really about what we deal with in the Startup and Grow Club. It really is a huge variety of topics that are important to members and it gives you an idea of the kind of benefits that you'll gain if you decided to be a member. And if you do, then do follow the link as well to the Startup and Grow Club and you can find out more about that. But in the meantime, download this presentation and I hope you enjoy this topic. There's things that we can do and principles that we can introduce to help us boost our business when we're thinking about rewilding. And Sarah is spearheading the development and project management of the rewilding network. So this is a network that exists if anybody's interested in finding out more after this meeting. Um, so Sarah herself has got a strong background in rewilding, biodiversity, monitoring and assessment, species, reintroduction, land management and restoration plans. So so an awful lot of knowledge and um, things that you can draw on if you're really interested in it. A little bit more about Rewilding Britain. So it's a charity that aims to catalyze rewilding across Britain, which personally I think is amazing by providing advice and support. So that's uh, advice and support is there for you if you need it. So the network brings together rewilding projects and local rewilding groups across England, Scotland and Wales. But the principles, as I said, definitely apply across the world. So it includes landowners, land managers and marine projects, as well as local groups. And the network exists to help those who are rewilding or supporting rewilding. So it helps people to connect with each other and share experiences. And particularly, I was interested today um, with Sarah coming in and giving us a bit of an overview about all of this, but also specifically how it can help, rewilding can help you boost your businesses and how you can think about it in those terms of, you know, you have a business, you have to make it profitable. There are things that we can do to support our natural environment that will also help boost what we're doing as a businesses that want to stay profitable. Great. So yeah, so I'm going to provide a bit of an overview about what rewilding is, and then I'm going to bring some examples in of how rewilding is complementing other nature-based enterprises. It, and it is focused on Britain, but obviously this can apply much further than that. I'm just going to start with a bit of an introduction in what rewilding is. Um, and actually, I, I'm an ecologist in terms of my background, and the more I learn about nature and rewilding, the more complex I realise it is. Um, this diagram just starts to show how um, ecosystems are a diverse system of threads and different elements and different habitats and different species, and they're all entwined together. And if you start to pull at one of those threads, you'll see that everything else starts to come with it. Um, and people are complex too, and communities and how people interact with the environment is also part of this um, and adds to the complexity. So what rewilding aims to do is to embrace this complexity and give space and opportunity for nature and for people to thrive and to lead the way and to allow those natural processes to dominate our landscapes more and make them a little bit wilder. In terms of the definition of rewilding, so Rewilding Britain um, defines rewilding as the large scale restoration of eco ecosystems to the point where nature can take care of itself and nature can lead the way. So it's not focused on outcomes. We don't say for this piece of land, we want to see wildflower meadows. For this piece of land, we want to see heathland. We start to say, okay, well, we create the conditions that allows nature to take over and create these dynamic systems where a habitat and a landscape might change from grassland through to scrub, through to woodland, and then maybe back to grassland again, as you have animals moving within that landscape. But it also encourages a balance between people and nature so that we can thrive together and people are very much a part of rewilding it's not about excluding people from that landscape but looking at how people can interact with nature support it and make sure that we're not damaging it in any way so at rewild in britain we have five principles of rewilding supporting people and nature together it's really important to make sure that rural communities urban communities 
are all being supported by this nature recovery and rewilding as well as as wildlife working at nature scale so we can rewild at smaller scales but really to allow these natural processes to dominate and take over we need to look at landscape scale really and look at how individual sites can contribute to the wider rewilding and nature recovery across the landscape letting nature lead so i've already mentioned given the conditions to allow nature to lead the way and and to show us um all the exciting and different things that happen that, that we don't expect to see. Creating resilient nature-based economies um, is really important and it sounds like a lot of you here are already um, working with nature-based economies and enterprises through the ecotourism that you're doing and then securing benefits for the long term. Rewilding is very much a long-term thinking, we're not talking about the next 10 years, we're looking at more the next 30, 40, 50 years or the next generation. So it's more long term thinking and, and looking at how we can secure those benefits in the long term. <clears throat> so what does a rewilding landscape look like? This is an illustration that we've taken of an upland valley in, in Britain. And we started to imagine how this could look if we allow nature to lead the way. So we can see that we've got this diversity and this complexity of different habitats, the rivers being allowed to move and meander through the landscape and it's being given space to flood um, when it's needed. <clears throat> well, you can see down in the bottom that beavers might be in this landscape creating a dam that's creating these pool areas as well as wetlands. We've got um, a dynamic system of, of recovering woodland that's starting to creep up the mountainside. And we've also got species returns such as lynx, wildcats, and an abundance of other species as well within this landscape. Um, but we can also see that there are people within this landscape, it's not excluding people from it. So we will have nature friendly um, um, enterprises, so things like uh, sustainable forestry, ecotourism, wildlife watching and, and a various other enterprises within this landscape. So it's very much beneficial to people as well as nature. And one of the things that we're trying to achieve through the network is to start to show that actually there's a kaleidoscope of different approaches to rewilding. <clears throat> and wherever you are within the landscape and within Britain, you will see different habitats emerging. So in Scotland, um, the rewilding approach might need more tree planting to create a seed source um, where trees have been absent for many years. Down in Dorset, you might see more heathland habitat starting to emerge. Um, in the lowlands of Sussex, uh, you might see a NEP style approach where you've got longhorn cattle and native breeds moving within a landscape and creating this wood pasture habitat. Um, but also we can look at, at rewilding in terms of coastal and marine environments and start to show that we can bring back those seagrasses, we can bring back kelp forests as well as oyster populations. So it really is capturing that local identity and that different approach to rewilding. So what does this look like? Um, it's very much um, looking at a mosaic of different habitats within the landscape. So we foresee this area where we will have core rewilding blocks we might have blocks of um, nature reserves, des designated sites as well. Um, and within that, we will also have these stepping stone habitats and corridors that have nature-based enterprises within them. So things like forestry, fishing, um, ecotourism, but they connect up these core areas to allow wildlife to move through the landscape. We know that there are benefits to rewilding and we are starting to see some of those benefit benefits coming through in the data. Um, the UK is actually ranked 189th out of 218 countries for biodiversity intactness. That's really low. Um, so we have got an ecological emergency. We've got climate change affecting us as well. Now is the time to look at options to reverse that. So we know that rewilding benefits wildlife. Um, it can also draw down carbon from the atmosphere and sequester it in vegetation and in soils. Um, it helps improve resilience to allow habitats to adapt to climate change. It can help to reverse biodiversity loss, but it can also support diversified and resilient nature-based economies, as well as improving our health and well-being. And we've started to collect evidence through the network um, to show the impact that rewilding is having, not only on wildlife, but also on people. And a recent analysis of over 20 sites across England showed that when we compared before rewilding and after rewilding, there was a 42% increase in full-time equivalent jobs after rewilding. Um, and these were more diverse jobs. So things like wildlife guys, tourism, catering, wedding venues, things like that. 
We also saw a ninefold increase in volunteering opportunities. So this provided people with the opportunity to get involved and experience these rewarding projects. And we also found that all the sites still supported grazing animals because grazing animals do have a really key role within our landscape. So things like cattle, pigs, ponies, and deer all working together to create these mosaics. Um, and we also helped to build resilience in terms of a diversity of enterprises. So I've just included some examples here of some of the enterprises that have been built within rewilding projects from wildlife watching on our coasts and in marine environments to also wildlife watching within safaris um, and other opportunities within the rewilding sites themselves. Food production, so providing some local food from orchards, um, also wild meat from the livestock. Um, education opportunities, well-being um, is something that, that comes through quite strongly from the rewilding projects and getting educational trips out there to raise awareness, but also land management jobs. So things like um, re restoring dry stone walls and, and stockman roles within, within the sites to help to manage the livestock. So I'm just going to go through some of the examples on the rewilding network. I included um, a link to the network page on the chat so you can have a look at all the different projects that we've got on there um, but we are starting to build this map of all the different projects across Britain and providing a profile of the different approaches that they're taking so that we can really start to promote some of the excellent rewilding projects that are happening across Britain. I'm just going to take you through a few examples to show you what nature-based enterprises are starting to come through associated with those rewilding projects. So up in the Lake District um, we've got a large-scale project on the network called RSPB Horsewater. And this project is working in an upland environment and it's working with farmers to still produce food, but to also support these core rewilding areas. And they also have a network of ecotourism opportunities up there. They've got um, badger hides and wildlife hides that visitors can hire or they can go on walks um, to see the wildlife and to experience that rewilding area. They also have Adventures, so they're using the native bell ponies that they have across the project, which have cultural heritage associated with them, to also do fell pony adventures. So they have visitors coming in, walking the site, camping on site and experiencing the wild nature and also learning about some of the cultural heritage that these animals had within the landscape. And they're starting to build this visitor experience to increase the diversity of the enterprises that they have on this project to support the project in the long term. Now, if we head to the lowlands of West Sussex, um, I don't know whether anyone on here has heard about the Nep Castle Estate, um, but it is one of the pioneering projects of rewilding in Britain. And it went from an arable farm um, that wasn't really making any money, was basically making a loss, um, and the basic payment scheme was the only thing that was keeping them propped up. And they went from arable and they changed their approach. Now they've got wood pasture there, they've got cattle, ponies, Tamworth pigs and deer, and now beavers and white stork as well, roaming the project um, and creating this great complexity of wood pasture and wetland habitats. But they've also diversified their enterprise. So they produce wild meat. Um, they also have glamping, camping, shepherd's huts. Um, they've got tree houses that support opportunities for people to go and stay overnight. And they've also diversified their offering in terms of wildlife safaris, educational visits, they do safaris on a whole range of topics where they invite people to come and learn about uh, reintroductions, rewilding your garden, how to um, manage stock, um, and, and also things like watching the deer rut um, or listening to nightingales or watching the turtle doves come in. So they really can show how there is this desire to experience rewilding and to have these guided tours, but also to complement that with camping, glamping, and ecotourism as well. And it's just really important to note that they do limit the numbers that go to the Nepa state to make sure that they're not um, increasing that footfall so much that it has a negative impact on wildlife. So it's, it's always a balancing act between supporting these nature-based enterprises but making sure they're friendly to the wildlife um, and the, the rewilding that's actually happening. Over to Norfolk now, um, and there's a project called Wild Ken Hill that's been rewilding for about three years now close to the Sandringham estate. They also offer experiences, so they offer safaris. Um, they haven't quite set up their camping and glamping site yet, um, but they've also just had approval for a license for white-tailed eagle reintroduction on their project. 
they've got beavers on that site as well. So they can start to have these really iconic species that people will want to go and visit. Um, and they have the, the nature-based enterprises to allow people to come and have these guided talks and walks and to understand what rewarding is, what these special species are and their impact on, on nature, but also just to get people out there and enjoying these landscapes. So it's kind of education as well as diversifying their enterprises um, going forward. We also cover um, Scotland and Wales. So up in Scotland, um, uh, we've got a medium scale project. Um, so this is a slightly smaller project than the larger projects that we've seen before, where they are also um, diversifying their enterprises through ecotourism. Um, they've had beavers on their site um, in the Scottish Highlands for about 15 years now. Um, so the picture on the left um, you can see is a beaver dam with the pool sitting behind it. And they've been doing beaver tours, um, but also they offer accommodation for visitors who can come and um, sit and enjoy the site, but also do some beaver watching in the evening as well. So ecotourism is very, very complementary to the rewarding projects that are happening and they could help to underpin and support those projects going forward financially, as well as improving awareness of, of what rewarding is and, and what our landscape should look like and some of these species that are missing that maybe could be returned. We also cover marine environments um, and a lot of the time the marine environments tend to go a bit unnoticed because it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. Um, this is another project up in Scotland, so the community of Aran Seabed Coast uh, Trust, which is shortened to coast. And this project has been working within um, the coast of Arran for probably about 15 years now. Um, and they, as a community, realised that the marine environments were being um, severely destroyed by trawling and unsustainable fishing practices. And they decided that they wanted to do something about it. So the community got together and they set up a no take zone. And this no take zone um, allowed nature to recover. And now they've got seagrass, oysters, lobsters, octopus, a whole range of different marine, marine species and habitats have returned to this coastline that now underpin a whole range of nature based enterprises such as diving, snorkeling, um, tourism, education. Um, but also supports what we call ecosystem services. So things like carbon sequestration, as well as um, improving water quality and, and returning this precious wildlife back to that area. So it's really important that we also consider the marine environments. And, it, and if you've got businesses close to marine environments, then this is another opportunity to draw visitors in who want to go and experience rewilding in that area. So just um, going to wrap up now after kind of providing you with some examples and a bit of a flavour about rewilding. And I just wanted to take some time to look to the future and the potential change that we might see over the next 10 years in Britain. Um, we're just entering the UN decade of ecosystem restoration, which has the hashtag generation restoration. And this is really saying that we know we're an ecological emergency. We know you're, we're facing climate change and returning nature and restoring nature and rewilding gives us an opportunity to mitigate some of that change. And there's a lot of work to try and see if we can return some of these iconic and lost species to our habitats. So things like seagrass restoration, returning our kelp forests to our marine environments, returning our native oysters. We've got white storks returning to Sussex through the Nepa stage and a few other projects. And they've just had, I think 15 chicks were fledging this year from the Nepa state. And this is only the second year that they've had them reintroduced there. So that's a great success story. And thousands of people go to Nep every year to go and see the white stork. We've got beavers returning to Britain. Um, we've got so many different sites where beavers are coming back and people want to go and visit these areas. They want to see beavers in the landscape and to learn about them and explore. Um, we might see lynx coming back into our, into British wildlife um, landscapes. And we can start to have associated ecotourism opportunities with the lynx, as well as the benefits they bring to controlling deer numbers. Pine martins are returning to Wales, and there's talk about bringing them back to England as well. Again, another iconic species that people want to see. And I've already mentioned white-tailed eagles. They're, they are already introduced to the Isle of Wight. There's now going to be a reintroduction in Norfolk at Wild Ken Hill. And we can already start to see the interest that's being generated from people who want to go and experience these animals and learn more about them. So I think the future is really hopeful in terms of these rewarding projects coming up. And we've seen from the COVID pandemic 
that people are reconnecting with nature and they want to go and connect with nature and they want to experience these wild areas. So there's lots of potential, not just for restoring nature, but also creating these nature-based enterprises that can be supported by these rewilding landscapes. If anyone wants to find out more about rewilding, um, we've got a fantastic website that's got a whole range of resources um, from rewilding land to rewilding the seas, to also looking at some of our missing species. And we also are building this with stories um, of what people are doing within the field and the different enterprises that are coming through from rewilding. So please do look at that. I also wanted to just to talk about a campaign we've got at the moment around national parks. And we know that national parks are really important um, for everyone really. And loads of people will be flocking to national parks this summer for their staycations um, and to experience these landscapes. But really they're failing on, on the wildlife side of things and they're not really supporting that diverse wild landscapes that we should be seeing from our national parks. So we have a campaign at the moment calling on the government for wilder national parks and to make sure that we're rewilding at least 10% of those national parks for wildlife but also for people. And finally I just want to leave you with the thought of we have um, a lot of crises at the moment with climate crises, we've got the pandemic, we've got the ecological crises and it can feel a bit overwhelming but actually there are lots of stories of hope and rewilding gives us that story of hope to show how things can turn around and we can restore these wild areas to our landscapes. But to do that, we need to think big, we need to think landscape, we need to think long term, and we also need to act a little bit wilder. Um, so I just wanted to leave on that thought, really. Thank you, Sarah. I got a couple of questions that have come in. Um, uh, before that, I've just got one thing I'd like to raise as well for our American friends. There is a, um, a very amazing, actually, project in Colorado that is very similar to this. I don't know if you know anything about that one, Sarah, um, but it's a it, it's huge. There's a huge number of landowners, investors. They're buying up huge uh, wads of land. They're introducing species. They're putting it back to its original, uh, so moving it away from uh, pasture and farming land, putting it back to its original state. And um, they are also talking about introducing glamping there. So that's, that's something good. to look up uh, it, for those in America. Really an amazing project on a far greater scale than we could ever do in the UK because we don't have so much space. But yes, I mean, it's pretty much the size of uh, the UK, yes, yeah. I think, is the, is the land space that they're talking about. Um, so that's definitely one that's very interesting to have a look at. And I, I believe you can already stay on it. Um, so that mm. might be something you want to do. Um, I was interested in the no take zone um, of that coast. What does no take zone mean? So essentially they designate an area where there's no extraction at all. So right. no fishing takes place in that area. They have people going in there to do things like snorkeling and kind of leave no trace enterprises, but they don't take anything from that. They have a fishing area around it. So a lot of the fish that recover within that no take zone then eventually move out. So it does benefit the fishing. Um, in a, a fishing community, but they just have this no take zone to allow that area to recover. And we see a similar approach with the core rewilding areas on the land as well. So you essentially have these core areas where you have very limited um, disturbance or, or, or enterprises. You wouldn't do any forestry or anything like that in that area. You might do some ecotourism, but essentially it allows the wildlife to have the space and, and lower disturbance levels to be able to recover. And then you have these other areas around it um, where you see this spill out um, of nature into those areas. So Joe, you have the first question. Can you say your question? Yeah, hi Sarah. Um, well, firstly, I'd like to ask Anna if she'd like to swap her 69 acres for my two and a half acres. <laughs> <laughs> if that's not an option. Um, two and a half acres, Sarah, that includes the glamping unit, so not massive. Um, what is their con I could do, I'm thinking more air-based birds, things, because obviously the land is restricted <clears throat> somewhat. Yeah, did you say it's mostly grassland? Well, it's it's kind of a field, which I now call a paddock, albeit with no animals in it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the seven units are probably going in about an acre. So really there's a spare acre maximum on a slope, no option for water. So it's restricted, but I'd like to do something. Mm. So the, when you're working to smaller areas, um, you tend to have to do more human intervention. 
um, so for rewilding to give, be given the space to, uh, to have these natural processes leading the way, you need to look at much larger areas. So if you're looking at a smaller area, I would probably recommend maybe thinking about something that maybe takes a little bit more intervention, but you could do things like um, trying to improve some of the wildflowers in the area. So maybe um, creating some disturbance on the ground and then maybe overseeding with some locally sourced uh, wildflower seeds or some green hay or something just to try and get that diversity within within the sward and then you can do things like um, cutting it at the end of summer so after the wildflowers have flowered um, to, and then take that off the land to reduce the nutrient levels and that will bring back more wildflowers in the following year um, and you can also maybe introduce things like yellow rattle to reduce those nutrient levels down because the lower the nutrient levels are the less dominant the grasses will be. And so you'll get more of this wildflower sword. So I say, if you're working at, it's not quite rewilding because it's a little bit more human intervention and you're looking at more of an outcome. But when you're looking at smaller scales, I would probably recommend to look at something like that. Maybe put a few trees in there if you've got some space. Um, that will provide some good shelter for bird species, but also small mammals. Um, and, and I would probably look at taking that approach because if you step back at that level and just let it go you don't have the animals in the landscape to be able to cause that disturbance that caused that diversity the other thing you could look at um you're probably it's the area is possibly too small but for some of these smaller projects um you can look to maybe speak to someone a farmer in the local area who might be able to lend you a pig or a cow or something for a short period of time to create that disturbance and there's a project down in devon that's just had two pigs on their land for 21 days in one area of it to start to create that disturbance and then they take them off again because they don't have enough space to support them so you could potentially look at that just to try and break up the sward a little bit and start to get those natural processes flowing um, the other thing you can do is things like put some camera traps out and see what you've got using your site and that's a great engagement tool for visitors as well because you can say look at look at the wildlife that's moving around that maybe they can't see and, and they can start to interact with camera traps is a great way to start to show what you've got and for you to also understand what's maybe on your site as well. If you've got an improved pasture that's really species rich in terms of the herb diversity, I wouldn't necessarily say that you should start rewilding that straight away because that's really good for biodiversity. So we tend to use the term protect the best and rewild the rest. So you've got really rich species rich grassland that in itself is quite a rare habitat and it provides opportunities for things like pollinators and stuff like that so I would probably say identify the areas where you've got really good habitat like that maybe keep managing it for that particular habitat and we've got a lot of rewilding projects that still have nature reserves designations within them and they still do that outcome management because it's such a good habitat they want to make sure they can maintain it we don't want to lose that habitat necessarily but I would also then look at what areas maybe aren't so good and aren't so species rich probably starting with the woodland and the area around the brook so any watercourses or ponds or anything like that that's a really great place to start because you tend to get quite quick results so if you've got a native woodland on your site that's a, a seed source for natural regeneration so I would say if there's some areas around that woodland that you can allow the woodland to start to expand out um, that might be a good place to start to expand and create that mosaic of habitats and if you're looking at things like um, a brook are there any ways that you can improve the area around that brook? Can you leave a buffer around it? Can you maybe put some woody debris in the, in the brook and pretend to be a beaver and start to create some diversity that way? Um, are there any areas where you can reconnect it to um, the habitat around it to allow it to expand out into some wetlands? And those will be really quick wins to start to see how the land not only reacts to that, but also how biodiversity then reacts to it as well. Um, so I'd say definitely keep going with the best of the kind of wildflower meadows and the unimproved grass and then keep that going. But maybe also then have a look at other areas that maybe you can let to go a little bit wild, see how they do, um, and then just start to see how it reacts. So I always kind of refer back to the, the Nepa estate and they actually didn't introduce animals on that site for eight years. They let the land rest for eight years before they then brought the animals in. So it's not a case of completely shifting to cattle, horses and pigs straight away. You need to start to understand how your land then reacts to different approaches and maybe pulling back a little bit in some areas. So it's very much a kind of phased approach to it. On the financing side of things, 
we have a team who are influencing policy so they've actually managed to get rewilding in the elms scheme um, we're also working hard to get natural regeneration in a lot of the grant schemes so there's the climate for nature fund which is something that we influence that has quite a good funding for tree planting but also for natural regeneration of woodland so definitely check that out because it covers a lot of the capital works um, but in the meantime for elms there's also countryside stewardship schemes so there's things like wood pasture that provides quite quite good financial incentives for that kind of approach so yeah just kind of understand I mean I'm sure you do understand your land but just kind of stepping back and understanding where are the best bits keeping those as best where are the areas that maybe we can start to regenerate a little bit more and then just kind of watching and seeing what happens and whether natural processes are working or whether there might need to be some tweaks so sheep, sheep are like little, and I'm sure you're all aware, they're like little lawn mowers. So they cut the sward quite really close. Um, and so they're great for things like if you've got species rich grassland or grassland that you're trying to protect, they're great for that because um, they help to take the nutrients off and create this kind of herb rich sward. But if you're looking at rewilding, we tend not to have sheep because they're not really they're not a native herbivore, they're not replacing one of the lost native herbivores. So we use cattle as a proxy and a replacement for the lost extinct aurochs, which were the really big wild cattle. We use ponies um, for the extinct tarpon or wild horse, and we use pigs as a replacement for wild boar. So those tend to be the ones for rewilding that we use because they create this diverse sward alongside the deer. So we tend not to use sheep um so we get a lot of flack sometimes for being the people who don't want sheep in our uplands um, but that's the kind of ecological reason behind it it's not because we've got an issue with sheep it's more the, the function that they have in the environment <laughs> those poor sheep <laughs> <laughs> unloved <laughs> thank you danny yes you've got a question Okay, so now I'm going to have to stop there because ne then the discussion went into detail about individuals, uh, pieces of land and rewilding and, and all those other projects, which of course I can't include on the podcast, even though I'd love to. And so I hope you enjoyed what you heard and were able to get some benefit from that and apply it to your own land, your own business. One of the things that I do realize when I speak to people who are either developing their glamping business or are planning to develop it or are already running it or whatever, that land management is a really huge part of their daily life. Whether it's a small business, whether it's a larger business, whether they've got a few acres or hundreds of acres, land management is a big issue. In a positive way, it can be really turned around to help the local environment, the local species, and also to bring back all kinds of wildlife as we heard there from Sarah King. I want to say thank you so much to Sarah for giving us her time, to giving advice to to the club members and if you want to find out more about becoming a member of the club then do please go on over to inspiredcourses.com forward slash club and that will give you the information you need we'd love to have you join us if you fancy it in the meantime i hope you continue to listen to the podcast come on back here and give me your input if you've got any thoughts about what you'd like to hear on the podcast in the future then please leave me re a review and pop it in there i'm always reading the reviews i love hearing from you if you found this helpful please reach out say thank you to sarah by popping a review it wherever you listen to this podcast on your podcast platform and uh, i'd love to hear your thoughts if certainly if you want to hear more about rewilding please do let me know because then i'll seek out the experts and we'll learn about it together so hope you have a fantastic day see you here soon take care bye bye